We are going to continue this conversation with an actor who made such an impression and such an important part of the Star Trek universe. It is hard to believe that he wasn't even there for that first year. But when he was there for the second and so on and the years that followed and to this day, he made the best impression and stays with us all. Please welcome Walter Koenig. Mister, have a seat. Let's talk. Let's talk. <laughs> okay. First of all, here we are. 50 years. What did you think back in 1967 when this all started for you? Did you have any idea that there would be a room full of 6,000 diehard, passionate Trekkers celebrating the 50th anniversary of the show? No, who just, no one. We all thought it was over, you know. Uh, I mean, we did the, I did two seasons. They were, they were sort of um, embraced by a sense of doom and despair because we thought we were going to be canceled, particularly after, Star, after the second season of Star Trek. Everybody went away feeling that uh, things were more abundant or would be. And, and then we were, we were uh, renewed for the third season, and that was even worse. I mean, everybody was depressed. There, there, wasn't any there weren't any smiles. We were done. We were, we were a dead issue. We were um, the, um, the incumbent that's, that has is, is lost the election or something. I don't know what that means, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we felt it was definitely uh, over. I certainly did. I'm, I'm a, a, an incredible cynic. And, and I, think, I always think in terms of the glass being not only half empty, but with a hole in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's what we And then, for five years, we kept saying, we're going to be renewed, you know, and, and then nothing happened. And then, we're going to renew a new, new series, and then nothing happened. And, you know, you, you, you can only take, that's like, that's like some kind of torture. Because they kept raising, I was going to say waterboarding, but that would be really, really <laughs> off the way off the way. Anyway, so um, I, um, they raise our expectations and our hopes, and then it would all come down. And, um, and then when they said that we, they would, I know you want to do a format of, uh, like a television format. I've got to stand. Is that all right? Huh? Yeah, let's stand. Let's stand. Let's dance. All right. Let's go. So, and, and, and then they said, we are going to do a new show. And, uh, and everybody, you know, lose five pounds. And we'll be ready to go. And, uh, you know, welcome aboard. Except I didn't get that letter. Everybody else got it but me. And I called up Jerry Hall. And I said, Jerry, I'm going to do a new show. And I called up Gene. And inevitably, this is the way things go. Invariably. He wasn't in town. We need it's really pressing information that you need. And the guy who can supply it isn't there. So I had to wait a weekend. But his secretary told me, don't be so silly, Walter. Of course you're in it. Everybody's going to be in it. I knew in my head that, that they didn't make a mistake, that something had happened. And sure enough, Jim called me. And he got back and he called me on a Sunday. And he said, well, the problem is, Walter, we're going to do a show that takes place five years in the past. And it is now, or three years in the past, it's now five years since we shot Star Trek. And you were playing a character who, to begin with, you were nine years older then. So 
I was about 15 years different. I had to play. That's 15 years younger than I played originally. So uh, he said, "Rip, we can't, we can't make it work. So you won't be in. You won't be in this new show." So I was right. He says, "We'll try to get you in as Chekhov's father." And so I thought, well, "Okay, I was willing to accept that." So then, of course, that didn't happen. And then there was another full start. And then we we had a big press conference, hundreds of people from the press, journalists, photographers, big breakfast at Paramount, and um, we were all there at that, at that juncture, we were all part of it, and Mrs. Shatner came out and said hello, and he was extraordinarily charming, and um, he started introducing the cast, and he said, Lieutenant O'Hura, of course, played by Michelle Nichols, Dr. McCoy is played by DeForest Kelly. George DePetke plays Sulu. And here is Mr. Chekhov. <laughs> Alas. But that what wasn't as discouraging as the fact is that after that, and after we set a date, we were still about eight weeks short of starting when we should have. Uh, so how can you how can you anticipate uh, a long voyage for our show and our destinies of Star Trek actors when everything and all the signs are saying somebody is trying to to uh, immobilize this effort and um, and then when we saw the first movie I thought it was really boring. It was really boring. <laughs> and I remember getting up and looking at Hal, Al, Hal Livingston, who was the, one of the producers, and we both rolled our eyes. It was a, this is the first time we had seen him. So, that was definitely the end of Star Trek. <laughs> Goodbye. You know, hey, you guys are too old. This is, this is what reviews were. Very elitist reviews. You're television actors. What are you trying to do doing movies? And you're way too old to be playing these roles. That was, you know, that was, that had to be the end. My God, that had to be. <laughs> well, we all know what happened. <clears throat> but we, all, we, we knew it in the stages. Star Trek II was very good. That made us hope for Star Trek III. Star Trek III wasn't so good. So that was it. And that's the way it went. On and on and on. Certainly after Star Trek V, we thought that we had... Uh, <laughs> the story about Star Trek V is... Uh, I was concerned... Uh, Bill was going to direct it. And I was concerned uh, that the behavior that I had seen would, would be um, uh, multiplied um, by the fact that he was now directing us. And I, I literally went up to George, Jimmy, and Michelle. I took him on the side and said, "Look, if he if he gives us a problem, if he's he's difficult with us. Any one of us said, I'm going to walk. And I want I want you to know that I'm not asking you to do it too, but I'm asking you to consider it <coughs> because I had only the most dire uh, consequences. Uh, I could foresee only the most dire consequences. Well, it turned out to be entirely. He was very." Uh, expressive and very affirming and very uh, reassuring to the point where it got a little icky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I said, whoa, that was good. <laughs> so the last day came and I said, George, today's my last day. He says, oh, well. We have to tell Bill. He says, no, oh, Bill. Today's <laughs> Walter's last day. Walter. <laughs> I'm going to make a statement out that I've never made. And I, I might not feel the same way I do tomorrow. But I just uh, sat with Bill for a couple of minutes. And I told a lot of jokes at his expense. And I don't think I, they were unjustified. 
But after talking to them, after talking to them for a couple of minutes, I do regret uh, that he it is. Uh, I do regret that he feels so uh, so badly about us. That's what I got from that. Okay. Um, Badly, I must clear, clear this, that he that he doesn't like us. Not that bad. I feel badly that he feels that we that we we we, we felt about him the way we do. So that's what I do. So it's, it's his it's his sensibilities that I acknowledge. Okay. I have a question. I have a question. Go back a bit. To uh, <laughs> so end of 1968, you're filming the last episode, Turnabout Intruder. You walk off the bridge of the TV series Enterprise, and then 1979 or late 78, you walk on the bridge of the movie Enterprise. What was your first impression when you saw the bridge of the movie Enterprise with that kind of like theatrical budget behind it? And did you just go like, all right? Now we're talking. This is what the bridge of the Enterprise should look like. I had no such feeling. <laughs> you know, for, for, for what it's worth, I, maybe I'm just simply old school, I don't know. But when I decided to try to be an actor, uh, after, after I went to college, I finished college at UCLA and I took one course, and I was sent by my instructor, I sent a letter of recommendation to the drama school in New York called Neighbor Playhouse. Uh, when I, that was when I really committed myself to being an actor. I had wonderful teachers, uh, and it was an extraordinary experience, particularly the first year. I was absolutely in hog heaven. And, um, but it was always the acting, it was the process of acting. And it's, it's, all, it's mostly been for me. I mean, I have an ego, and I like the compliments and the applause, and I like the reinforcement that I get. But it was always about how can I be, become a better actor? How can I how can I uh, evolve as an actor? Uh, and I'm I'm very I'm very tough on myself, but maybe it's justified. I don't know. But so that's where my my essence has always been. That's where my my sense has always been, and. Great gadgets that we've we've introduced to the world, uh, the electronics that have evolved out of Star Trek. That's always been very secondary to me. It doesn't have a great deal of importance to me. My sense is, you know, am I am I bringing more to the park than I did previously? Am I improving as an actor? Am I finding the nuances and uh, that and the subtleties that really good actors find in the roles they play, and you can recognize them. You see, you say, yeah, "That's just not somebody screaming. That's somebody who has a lot going on." So that's that's where my head has always been. So the bridge of the Enterprise, that's really nice, you know. Uh, it's, the, the, the moment I had on the first day of shooting, we did, we did one scene where it was, it was a kind of a panning shot, as I recall, of all of us at our stations. And I was at this new security station. And, um, and that was, we did that, we got that out of the way. And then we set up for a four shot, of, uh, F-O-U-R four shot, of George, Michelle, and me, as Captain Kirk steps out of the elevator. So we're standing there, we're lighting, and you're getting ready to do the shot. At that point, I said, my God, we're really making this movie. <laughs> it took the second shot for me to realize that we were really making And that was an ecstatic moment, because I was absolutely euphoric about that. So we had so many false starts that I didn't think we'd ever get made. And I still didn't believe it after we did the first shot. <laughs> and we needed the four of us to be standing there. So that's a very singular moment. You talk about improving your performance, always trying to be better. And I would say, and I'm sure that this room will agree, 
that your performance as Chekhov was never better than in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. So my question is, at what point during the making of that film, whether it was when you read the screenplay or when you were on the set with Nick Meyer, Nicholas Meyer, did you realize this is, this is the one, this is the movie that is going to be the one that's going to Everyone's going to love it. Fans are going to love it. It's going to do well world, world over, and you're going to love it. Well, I loved Ricardo Mandelba. I thought he was the most wonderful. He was bigger than life, but in a very positive way. Uh, and his performance was so imposing. I mean, he was such an imposing antagonist. Uh, you're worthy uh, of going toe to toe. With a myth, myth, almost mythological captain character. Uh, so that to me was the best thing about Star Trek II. Um, uh, that there was such a dynamic sense between the antagonist and the, prota and the protagonist that they were, they were equal in combat, which is the way it should be. You know? I mean, that's the more that, that, that heightens the conflict and makes the outcome more questionable, more doubtful. So, I, I thoroughly enjoyed making the movie, but that isn't the movie that told me that we had something special. The movie that told me we had something special was Star Trek IV. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I read that script, and I knew it was a winner. It was okay. very tough to read a script, no matter who you are, to read a script if you've been in the business 30 years and know whether it's going to work or not. It's just, it's one of those incomprehensible things. I think it's a little easier if you read a play. Because a play is all words. And you can, and you can hear the words, and, and, and you can imagine how they're going to be performed. And the situations are always so strong in, in plays. They don't rely on special effects and CGI. It's the story that, that carries the word, the kids that, that carries the play. And, and the relationships between the characters. But when I read Star Trek IV, uh, this, this is an absolute winner. This, this movie has got to be a winner. Not only was it a great story and had wonderful, unique scenes for all of the actors, um, but it was, it was hearkening back to what, what was part of Gene's motivation to begin with, telling stories that had socio-political implications that referred to topics, that was a top, was a, referring to topical issues that we were not perhaps totally uh, prepared to address in contemporary times, but we, we, we could tackle uh, at a time in the future. And, and, and that's what such a film is about. Praise Leonard and all those involved in, in creating that story because it was an environmental story and it was about extinction and it's something that we face. Uh, by the way, I just finished reading a book, it's not new, it's a few years old, called The Sixth Extinction. And anybody who was interested in, in the help of this planet and, and the, uh, the future of this planet should read it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's written by a, a young woman or a woman who is. Uh, obviously a scientist in her own right and has done an extraordinary amount of work researching it and detailing it. Okay. Okay. A real, real funny story. So I moved into a new building uh, about six years ago and I found out that my neighbor co-wrote the screenplay for Star Trek IV. So I'm knocking on his door and he opens the door and he goes, oh, it's you. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But anyway, let's open up to some questions here. He's got a question for Walter Koenig. You, in the top. Oh, hello, uh, Mr. Koenig. Thanks so much for coming back to Vegas. It's a pleasure to see you. And my question is about Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Yeah. And there's one line that uh, Chekhov has when the Klingons are about to beam over from their ship to the Enterprise. Yes, who's coming to the... <laughs> line 
you know, obviously, I'm not sure if you're aware, was originally meant for the character of Uhura. Huh? And Michelle Nichols refused to say it because she felt it was racially sensitive. So I was wondering if you were aware of this at the time, and if you had any opinions about Chekhov getting a line instead. Wow, I've never heard that. <laughs> wow, I've never heard that. I can tell you a couple of stories that you've never heard about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, uh, if I forget, because I, once in a while I have a tendency to do that, we'll come back to your question. But I wanted to tell you, incidentally, you know, this whole, this whole controversy about uh, Sulu being gay in the new movie, and that there was never a reference to it, uh, on, 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 you all, you've all heard that, right? and George's re reaction to it. And, and, and supposedly there was never a reference to George, to, 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 I mean, to Sulu being gay. Well, in, in the next generation, initially, we were all supposed to be in it. And then they, and then they pared it down to three, to, to three actors. And, well, Leonard and the forest begged off. They didn't want to do it. They didn't think it was it, it added anything to their history with Star Trek. Um, but at one juncture, before I had been cast, let me see how this works. Yeah, the reference about Shakwa, about Sulu's daughter. Remember that? There's a reference to it. It was supposed to be Chekhov's story. Uh -huh. So, if it had been Chekhov's story, that would have added to the argument that we don't know anything about Sulu's history, and then we, we <laughs> screw it, I guess. <laughs> What was your question? Uh, yes, who's coming to dinner and check Oh, yeah. Things. Well, there's a curious moment about that. No, I never, first of all, I never heard, I never heard that Michelle was, was upset about that. Have you asked her? I mean, has she admitted to that? She, she, she has. It's been in, uh, in several of the books uh, written about the movie. Okay. Okay, it just seems like, it doesn't seem like a, a point of controversy to me. In any case, I got, I got the line, and, and I knew it was going to be a funny line. And uh, I'm sitting here, and Nick, we were rehearsing it, and I came to my line, and I said, guess who's coming to dinner? And Nick said, uh, no, that's not what we're looking for. Try it again. And I knew that was wrong. I knew it was wrong. <laughs> guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> I did it again. I mean, I was just blowing this. Wonderful opportunity to have a, a choice moment. It took me three or four times. Guess, guess who's coming to dinner? You know, yeah. ridiculous, ridiculous that I should have that problem. But I was like on a on a, on a rewind on a tape or something. I'm just repeating it the same way. So that's my hilarious story about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right over on this side, sir. Um, hi there. Um, I think it's fantastic that you've been involved in some fan films. What's that? What's that? It was great that you were involved in some of the fan films. And uh, you did one that's called To Serve All My Days, uh, where you act opposite somebody playing a younger Chekhov, uh, played by Andy Bray. And I think it's very, very poignant. And I thought it was a beautiful scene. My question is, would you like to see CBS find somebody to play Chekhov, you know, a replacement person to play Chekhov in the new films. Do you think that Chekhov I, should I, be... I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I applaud J.J. Abrams' decision and his group's decision not to bring in a, a new Chekhov for the movies. He was a terrific human. He was a really, really good human being. You know, we, I remember when Richard Nixon died, people had good things to say about him. You know, I found that was amazing. 
and we'll find good things to say about it. So we always, when we eulogize people, we always find something good to say. But this young man was really a spectacular person. He really was. I'd only, I only knew him for a couple of hours uh, on the set when I sat and talked to him. And I knew that he was creative and gifted as a, as a talent. But I found such a, a warm, nice guy. Such a good guy. And, and, and you know, I had never spoken to his castmates about him, but I read the quotes, and evidently that was, you know, a universally held position. So it was very, it was very painful. As little as I knew him, it was very painful for that, for that to have happened in my life. And there are personal reasons as well. But um, I don't know how I feel about losing a new check. Is that, is that what they're going to do? They're going to do the... the no, JJ's not going to be cast the character. No, no, I know that, but I mean in the CBS series. And no, I think I was thinking about the, the films. Um, you know, I, I would like to see Chekhov recast, but also I'd like to see more of you uh, in more fan films. Yeah, are they going to use the reg original characters? <coughs> in the CBS? I think you're confusing CBS yeah. with doing the new TV show. Paramount does the films. Yes, yes. So he's, so he's, I think he's talking about CBS doing the film, so CBS. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. CBS asked, thinking about bringing back the original characters. Is that true? No, not, no. They're moving forward to the TV show, but it is not featuring the original okay, characters. Okay, so then, then that's your answer. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Next question over here. Hi. Hi there. I was wondering who you enjoyed playing more, the good guy Chekhov or a bad guy Alfred Bester from Babylon 5? Oh, yeah! Okay. Thank you for the question and the implied compliment. Um, I never thought of Bester as a bad guy. <laughs> you, can't, you can't invest yourself in a character and not believe what he does. You know, if you step up, up, up back from it and you, and you editorialize or you come to conclusions that, uh, uh, about him that, that are onerous to play, that are odious to play, then you're not really giving yourself to the part. So I've, I found a way to justify what he did. He was very loyal to his, his, his troops. His, yep. The people that he represented, uh, he had, he did have a heart. He, he didn't like, didn't like the uh, the Earthlings so much, the humans uh, that he was in conflict with. But it was always, it was always because he had felt a responsibility to his people. So, and I find that a very admirable trait. Um, so, I didn't think of him as a bad guy. But to answer your question. I, 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 I surely did enjoy playing best. Well, movie. we loved you, as him. Yes. Yes! Jack yes. 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 over here. Hello, sir. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. My question is, what is a funny and memorable moment you have from filming any of the Star Trek movies? I have a repeat. A funny, memorable moment from filming any of the Star Trek movies that you have. A funny, memorable moment. Funny, memorable Oh, well, I've told this story before, and if you've been here before, you've probably heard it. I think the funniest moment that I remember is, it was, <laughs> it was a scene with Scotty, Sulu, and McCoy walking down the street in the morning in San Francisco on Star Trek IV. And I don't know what the, the business was, but the, the action was in the scene. It had something to do with finding something. And George had decided, I assume, that as part of the action, he would look in this, in this window of this saloon. And it was a real saloon. It was, it was a real set. It wasn't a set. It was a, a real sight. And he'd look in, and this is 11 o'clock in the morning, and there was a woman at the bar drinking at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, and she turned and saw him and went. <laughs> so George you know, walked away. 
So they, they, they rehearsed this three or four times, and each time he'd come out, he'd look in the window, and she would uh, <laughs> So they said, okay, action. This time George comes down, he looks in the window, there's the woman going, Oh, wow. Right back here. <laughs> Mr. Conan, thank you for, for showing up. I've been a long, big fan of yours from Star Trek, Babylon 5, and even the one horror movie I know of you doing, which was Life Force. My question to you is from Babylon 5, what is the best, best moment that you would remember? Huh. Well, you know, it's a plethora of riches. Yeah. Uh, I just had so many moments that I, I thoroughly enjoyed. I, every, I did 12 episodes, and every episode was, was fun to me. Every episode, there was, you know, forgive my egotism, but there was, there was some focus on my character. He was pretty much, uh, you know, central to whatever plot we were doing. So it was, uh, I just felt like I was in hog heaven, as they say, throughout all of the episodes that I did. But I guess the moment that was, um, that's most memorable for me is the, is the moment when I'm sitting across from uh, Garibaldi in the train. And we're having a very intimate conversation. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. what it was about, yeah. but it was a very personal, conversation, I think fraught with some jeopardy or peril or threat or something. But I remember that being um, uh, a scene where we, there was a lot of contact and a lot of interaction. And by the way, um, I just, uh, as you have uh, just heard about uh, Jerry Doyle's passing, it's, uh, yes. it's another shock, it's another, you know, I've lived long enough now to, to see it happening quite frequently. And, he was, he was a, I didn't, I certainly didn't agree with his politics, um, but he had a rational basis for his politics, as opposed to the madness that's going on now. Uh, was, you know, was, uh, he was a fiscal conservative, and, but he was very bright, and he was very articulate, and very wide, very funny. So he, he it's, it's a great loss, it's a great loss. It's, and I'm sorry, if you hadn't had a chance to meet him, uh, I feel badly about that. Okay, maybe go. Got time for one more question over here. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Canning. <laughs> if I have one very significant and important question for you, mm -hmm. are do you think Star Trek conventions are a Russian invention? <laughs> <laughs> Get back to you on that. <laughs> Actually, I have a question. How rewarding has it been for you to do Star Trek Renegades? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Well, you know, you know, we can no longer call it Star Trek Renegades. It's Renegades to Requiem. And it's been a fulfilling experience. You know, I know there are people in the world who are going to say, this guy's been playing the same role for 50 years? How pitiful, how pathetic, you really, can't get past that? That's like uh, um, Edward Wilk, the booth that was the Shakespearean actor who played Hamlet, I think, for 30 years. He was, all he did was play Hamlet. But my response is, I've never been able, it's been coitus interruptus for 50 years. I, I've never been able to feel fulfilled as a character. I've never been able to feel that I've dimensionalized that character. And that's why I keep going back to it when the opportunity arises. Now, I don't stay awake nights thinking about it, but when the opportunity arises, I've gone back to try to find the essence of this guy, to make him totally clear. After all, there's been so much approbation and, uh, and energy, and, and such positive energy about my performing, what is essentially you know, a, a bit part. And uh, so when this opportunity arose, when, when Sky Conway came to me and said, we want to do another 
episode, and this time, I, and we'd like you to come back, is Adney and Chekhov. Well, at that point, we were still able to use the name Chekhov. I said, only if we can do it, have a spectacular heroic ending to his, his story. I said, what, what, what happened with Captain Kirk was an abomination. It was an incredible insult, the way they, they let him go. I would, I would like, I, I, you know, doing this under, you know, circumstances that certainly cannot be considered mercenary. Uh, I, I would like, I would like uh, that to happen. Well, the script they, they came up with after six drafts, and I was involved in each of the drafts, uh, I think, my fingers crossed, because I've been wrong times before, I think we have something really, really unusual. It's, it's a Star Trek, it's an episode from a series in the 60s uh, that carries with it the, the human element, the, the, the personal element, that, uh, and, the, and the message, the socio-political message that was so outstanding in that series. It goes, da 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 You know that sense. So we got through one day of shooting, and we got the message from CBS that we couldn't use, and we couldn't do anything that was more than 15 minutes long and fifty thousand dollars as a fan, as a fan-inspired film. Well, first of all, nobody in this in this film, with a speaking role, is anything but a professional, and you'll be able to recognize everybody because they're all from different uh, different manifestations of Star Trek. We just eliminated all the references. And it, and it was easier than you would think. So, I'm, uh, right now, I haven't seen it yet. We're still, we're just about to wrap. We have two more days left, and then we're gonna go into post-production. But I, I would, I would, I would ask you to look, look for it when it's done, when we do the post-production, and give it a chance. Because I, I think it's something really, really good. I think it is really, 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 really. Yeah. 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 It's seen my time. Let's give a very 50th anniversary.